All right. G'day. Welcome all to another highly adequate podcast. I'm Desi and I'm a content developer and podcast host. And today I'm joined by my friend Tom Marsden, who I met ages ago when we used to be both be in the military together. And he's going to share his journey today of how he got into cyber and where he is now. Um, but for those listening, whatever you're listening on, uh, this is on YouTube if you want to watch it or you can get this from your favorite podcast app if you're listening on the go. Um, but with that, thanks, Tom. Thanks for joining me and welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Desi. Great to be here. Mate, love a chat. So uh, can't think of anything better to do on a Sunday afternoon, to be honest. That's true. We did. Well, I did say you could have a beer while you're, you're doing this as well, but what are you drinking? Oh, you've got your beer there? Well, I've got a, a risky like, late afternoon coffee which like, we'll see how my sleep goes tonight off the back of that. I'm the same. I've actually, I've got a beer sitting in a stubby cooler <laughs> next to it. So I'm kind of okay. I've lined up. I'm ready to go. I thought I'd better have a coffee. So, you know, you get the best me. And <laughs> then um, for, the, <laughs> I can have a for, those, for those listening at the end, we can get the, uh, the, the less bushy eyed, bright tailed. Yeah. Kind of Tom. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm. What, have, what right. have you got there? You got a beer? I yeah, no, coffee. so I've actually got. It looks like I've, I got caught down this before because it's in a like a pint glass, right? Yeah. But it's um, on my recent trip overseas, I got really into espressos with coconut water. Oh, nice. So I'm, that's what I'm drinking. Mm. Um, but again, it is quite risky because it's the 4 p.m. Yeah. Uh, yep. Am I going to sleep tonight? Kind of thing. So yep. I think it'll be the same. I've, I've got another podcast tonight. I might have to have a beer on that one. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I am a big fan of like. Bed. I love like a bit of tonic or a bit of soda water in espresso yeah. too. Like, it's quite nice. But anyway, I digress. Oh, no, we can talk about coffee for ages. And I found some very interesting um, flavors that they had over there. So one of my other favorites was uh, espresso with yuzu. Because mm. it's quite tart. Like, yuzu is quite yeah. tart. And then you get the bitterness of the coffee. Yeah. Um, and that was really interesting. But, yeah, it was it's- good. I was surprised, pleasantly surprised at the uh, quality of coffee overseas, which was good. Yes, I do. I do have the, um, like, you know, James Hoffman, like the, the Silver Fox coffee dude. Um, yeah. He, I, I can see there's like a YouTube video sitting there in my feed of him drinking like a $350 coffee. And oh. it's sitting it's sitting there and I'm like, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm just thinking, like, Ooh, I wonder. Uh, so I'm very curious. So there's a coffee place. Um, oh, I forget what it's called. It's like. Back as something, but if you've ever been through like Singapore International, mm. when you first kind of come into the arrivals and there's that big golden coffee place and it's like a chocolate, um, like they sell chocolate and coffee, like yeah. that's their, their yeah. thing. And I, I was going through once and they had a coffee that was like sixty dollars for for a coffee, and I was just like, "Is the coffee good?" To the guy behind the counter, and I like I drink yeah. long blacks, like I don't drink any milk or yeah. ch- chocolate or anything in it. And he was just like, yeah, it's really, really good. Like, that's what you're paying for. And I tried it and it was just like, it was like filter coffee. Mm. And I was like, there was no bitterness. <laughs> there was no taste. And I was just like, oh, I just, it was so disappointing to pay yeah. that much money for, for coffee. But yeah, the experiences that we try and get disappointed by. That's uh, it. I mean, you got to take yeah. a gamble, even on an airport coffee sometimes, right? Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, true. All right. We've talked yeah. about coffee enough. Let's let's talk about you, which is why I got you on. Mm. Um, the first question that I love asking everyone is, what does a normal day look like for you? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm week, I'm coming into week four in a new job. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I'm kind of finding my feet, I, I would suppose. But if I were to abstract away over, you know, over anyway, um, mainly it's kind of you know, log on. See what see what's going on. Uh, I do first thing is really read, right? Like, yeah. um, it's reading. Like, are the new? Is there any new reporting going out? And I, I suppose I should kind of set the scene, right? Like, I'm doing some threat hunting at the moment. Mm. In large, yeah. Um, so you're looking large to cybersecurity see the company. The world's burning while you're asleep. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. what's what's been going on? You know, particularly if you're, you're logging in on a Monday. Mm. And you're working as a part of a global team, right? Where there may you may be the first person coming online for that team um, sure. over yeah. the you know dropping into the week on Monday. Um, what's what's been going on? If there's stuff that's been kicking off over the weekend, mm. um, 
what's been happening is there, is there something there that's really like a priority you'd probably go off and and start ch- start checking for yeah. um and i i suppose that kind of takes you takes us to the next bit which is like okay i've read i see what's going on mm. um are there if there's something that's like really on fire that's when you jump into it but otherwise i like to take a bit of a step back and like okay well what's like what's the plan for today yeah. um you know i kind of maintain a bit of a uh just like a, a little note card for myself every day it's mm-hmm. like this is this is the date these are the things i want to do and so you know by the by the end of the week i've got a little stack of note cards it's kind of like this is what i set out to do this is what i got done mm-hmm. um and i find that it's like quite helpful and even just for keeping me accountable day by day right as i've got yeah. this little got this little note um so I jump into that and write out kind of whatever it is and, and looking across like okay these are the the longer term projects i've got um these are the short term little things that i want to get done as little as like hey maybe i want to submit some leave um all the way through to <laughs> that's you know, very important to remember it is very important definitely to remember get caught up in in the job right exactly exactly yeah. right so you know is it something as, as menial as submitting leave or is it more like hey here's like this a document that I want to write or here is a, a mm. uh, I want to research and develop a proof of concept for you know, maybe a system or a collection mm. of systems and do we have is it the very first step in beginning to understand that problem that I need to be able to you know, maybe just do some reading some more reading or some more research mm. on something um, so I suppose that's that's kind of like very <laughs> high level right and there's a lot of like hand waviness of read and do stuff but i think really when it comes down to the core thing that i'm doing is like writing writing queries to try and find stuff Mm. writing reports uh that come out of the back of that and sending notifications to customers over like hey we have found some stuff um and then that might be you know we might be working with some of the the dedicated intel guys to understand Mm. like what what extra context can they provide? What things can I share back to them? Um, might be you know, pulling pulling the occasional binary or occasional file to try and once you've you've run a query and you've got some results back, and it's like you know, well, now you got to investigate them, figure out what you're looking at and whether it's any good or not. If it's no good, then uh, you know, that's I suppose when you get to that point of of sending out a, a customer kind of inquiry or a Mm. You know, a bit of a heads up like hey there's some dodgy here yeah um so i'm interested i have yeah. i haven't had too many threat hunters on i don't think interviewing uh plenty of instant responders and i guess sock analysts mm. do you ever find because you mentioned at the start there that you may come on on monday morning and there's quite can be quite a lot of news that is filtered in over the weekend a lot of attacks happen on a Friday and then get more publicized over the weekend. Mm. Do you find yourself still being drawn into, say, something really big happens and you're like jumping on on a weekend still? Or do you, because you've got that global team and maybe you're not in that position, like you don't have to monitor the feeds until you jump on on Monday? I think uh, one of the things that I've generally been pretty good at and um, do do my best in, right, is actually is like that like very clear separation of like Mm. the weekend is really as much as I try to like is my time. Um, Like I've got enough things happening on the weekend that keeps me busy throughout the time. Mm. So to then, you know, to have some kind of like work drop into it disrupts family time. It disrupts, you know, the other things that I've got to get done over a weekend. Mm. Um, in the event that there is stuff that like really kicks off, right? Like there's, there's always stuff that I'm like, oh, that's juicy or, oh, I want to go and investigate that. Yeah. Or, you know, you see something in Slack on like Saturday morning, have a bit of a scroll through, maybe the guys in the US found something. Like yeah. I am partial to jumping on and being like, oh, well, like what's happening there? Mm. Um, but for them, those are really the circumstances where I'm like, okay, well, this needs, this needs help. And I, I think really like a mark of experience in those situations is being able to make the assessment and say Mm. is this something that's burning now and it can't can't wait until later or is it something that really does need 
extra eyes and extra assistance and yeah. we need to come up with that kind of round the clock um, you know, response to it. Mm. I, I think that you really see like people have very different responses to and have very different thresholds, right? Like at what point do you pull people in if there's no system? People mm. have a perspective that's very much driven by you know, their own just like, oh, it feels, it feels like we need it or it feels like we need some help here. But if, you, if you've seen, if you've been pulled in on the weekends enough to deal with stuff, I think your lens changes yeah. pretty significantly, pretty quickly. Yeah. And I, I think it's definitely where I've seen that, oh, it feels like this is big and it's going to be big. Definitely comes more from my experience from the customer side because there's mm. the lack of experience and it definitely shows the yep. maturity of the company you're with, particularly the senior leadership, to push back and go, yeah. this is actually something that can just wait till Monday. Like, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. And even and, even and a difference then between, like, it's, say, an internal uh, internal IR and, like, consulting IR too, right? And the, mm. the difference is in, say, exposure to, say, what potentially consulting or external IR and their, their kind of, like, um, I suppose sensitivity levels just get beaten away through through abuse <laughs> or like for a lack of a better word um and maybe internal like something that would be uh really like let, let's say like problematic for an internal team an external team might look at and go no nah, no nah, actually like that's fine like you're well yeah. earning um yeah but it is it's so you have to be very careful because you can't turn around to that internal team and say well, your your concerns don't matter. Come um, down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's very it's a very delicate balance. Um, yeah. And if they've got the system in place, often you've kind of got to let them run their system, right? Like if their mm. system says like, hey, no, this is like P one P two. You kind of got to treat that and say, well, you know, at the end of the day, like this is a professional IR team following their processes and doing their job. Like, yeah, you've also got to have respect for that. Yeah, and I found that generally. If a team's that mature that they have a P1, P2 and they have a process, they're generally pretty good. Yeah. Like it's not... Yeah. If if it is, they're like spooling up with something that may not be that big. Like it might just be really big for them and it's the first time totally. they've experienced yeah. it, but they're not going to spool up at like the tiniest thing, which I find teams that don't have that, it's yeah. everything that they're just like, oh. Or, or even when they're like, they read something in the news and they don't fully understand it. And then they're like, oh, we need to do a threat hunt over the weekend. You're like, do you, do you have the tools in place? Do you have the, yeah. like, this, you, exactly. this is going to cost you a lot of money. And then what's your threat profile to actually get attacked by this? Like pretty mm -hmm. low. So mm -hmm. exactly. yeah, it's the less mature ones that I found from experience did that. Yep. Yeah. No, couldn't, couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. So we'll go back a little bit from before you got into the job you did now. Mm. So maybe you could just like share with the listeners how you got into cyber and what your kind of journey was from where you thought you didn't consider yourself in cyber and kind of stepped your way through to this job. Yeah. I suppose how far, how far back do we want to go? Do we want to go pre like pre air force as well? Or like, yeah, if, cause if I really only you, stepped well, into cyber think. officially there, but there were certainly things that changed my trajectory. I think. I, I think, so in the past, like people, especially um, people who got into considered cyber like a long time ago yeah. as well, where they were just doing like um, IT jobs or something that got them into the security field. But yeah, where you think you you first got into it, which sparked kind of like an interest that led you, because you've, from my knowledge of your trajectory, mm. like it's been quite technical all yeah. the way through, even up till now. So yeah. yeah, wherever that kind of started for you. Yeah, so I mean... Uh, I think if I, I kind of think like really even like high school, right? Like I was probably hanging out in some websites that I shouldn't have been um, <laughs> and, and trying to like muck around and get an unfair advantage and maybe some games and stuff that I shouldn't have been, right? <laughs> cool, um, yeah. And that, I think, and then at high school too, I was like in the position where I could take... Um, like I could take one of my classes as like a full on like computer science class. So, and being able to learn like, yeah, some of the fundamentals of like 
of computer science and learning learning Java kind of in a like an education environment, like kind of from age like 14, 15 was pretty mm. in, like uh, had quite a significant impression. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to go from there and say, okay, well, um, that's that's cool. I'd always kind of wanted to do something like engineering y, um, flip flop between a few things. But then when I yeah, went and joined, joined the Air Force and, and joined as you know, an electronics engineer, um, at the time, I thought, I wish that I could go and do software. Like, I wish they would offer software mm. um, as an option. Because I guess, like, for context as well to the listeners, you joined um, ADVA. So yeah. you went to the, yep. the military university. So the yeah. choices for degrees are more limited than if you went to totally. a standard university. Yeah. Totally. And, and I mean, you know, these days you can join and do a, a cybersecurity undergrad, right? You can mm. do, like, a Bachelor of Science in, in cyber or something like that or a IT uh, cyber. But at the time, um, it was kind of like either an IT degree or an electronics engineering degree. And I was like, well, I, I still like electronics and I like engineering stuff. So um, we'll give, give that a go. Yeah. Uh, and like I was pretty fortunate, I think, within my first year there to to start talking to people that were like, hey, it looks like cyber is kind of a thing that you can do once you get out of here. Like mm. if, you're, if you're keen, like there's this... There's a bunch of people in the Air Force that do it. Like you just got to know the right people, talk to the right people, um, and and you know put your, put your hands up and see what you can do about it. So mm-hmm. that's kind of um, uh, it was between that and then also there was like an extracurricular club there for just a bunch of nerds that like to do cyber stuff. So um, nice. you know I was really fortunate too to have a have a dude uh, in the same building that I lived in who was like and still to this day is like super super intelligent um and like a really good like security and and technology brain um Mm. he's no longer no longer in defense but between like his kind of involvement in that club too it kept me relatively close to it and it was good to have someone that really for a couple of years there we like had similar interests and could talk about mm. this type of stuff. Mm. Um, and in such like a formative part of your life too, right? Where you're, you're kind of going through higher education and you're, you're developing views on the, the world and trying to learn, just learn so much, like having mm. someone that you could talk to that also talk about cybersecurity and then a bunch of other people that wanted to talk about it in the context of uh, the military as well mm. was, was super, um, super influential. Uh, so yeah, kind of from that from that point, I'd say that's really where I set my sight on like I'm going to go and do electrical engineering. If that's what drops out the the other end of this, great. I'm happy with that career. But if I can make this cyber thing work, like that's you know that's the five star solution for me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I remember in my third year or maybe my fourth year dropping in to the building and like yeah, Alex Desmond was my like the person that was like yeah man come in and um yeah i think you showed me around and ct was there and we had a bit of a bit of chat and got a bit of an understanding of like what you guys were doing day to day and so i forgot about that actually when you first came in yeah yeah i think you would have been there for maybe 12 months or something at the time and yeah we used to get quite a lot of students through so it'd always be like showing around i just yeah i remember when you got posted to the squadron um and like started getting into it and did you go, you went straight on to training when you got there or you were there for a little bit first? I was there for a tiny bit and did PD&T. Um, yeah. And so I did oh, a couple of right. PD&T yeah. rotations. Yeah. And then yeah. dropped on a training. Okay. So I was like super, and yeah, really super, super fortunate from that respect mm. as well. Amazingly yeah, yeah. fortunate. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, like I love doing these interviews because like I've known you for, for quite a few years and I always learn new things about people. So it was interesting like hearing how you said you you had that um, good relationship with someone in your building that helped you like spur that interest and you could talk to. So I'm interested to know like from from your transition because you've kind of like come from high school, you had wanted to do something technical and then you were pretty much straight into cyber. Hmm. Um, what stands out for you in terms of 
maybe self-study courses or other mentors that have really been significant in getting you to where you are now? Yeah, so I think uh, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One, I mean, you, you cannot say that the the Air Force is like, initial cyber training pipeline is not one of the most if not the most influential mm. thing in in really of any of our careers i think in terms yeah. of developing hard hard skills yeah. um aside from that definitely like i'm just such a huge believer in in the environment that you surround yourself in and the people that you surround yourselves in can mm. can just have such an outsized in, impact on where you end up and, and such just just such an impact um mm. so i think that you know, getting involved within that that cybersecurity club early um was was great just even, even for networking for understanding some of the some of the basics um when i was going through you know it's part of like an engineering degree right and you go and do your uh, your work experience placements yeah I aligned mine to go and work at like a managed security service provider up here in Brisbane that, you know, they had, um, they were like, yeah, well, sure, we'll take a dude that doesn't really know anything about IT. Like he's, he's keen and knows some technical stuff, knows a bit of like how to read some code and how to program, but like doesn't really know how to administer like a Windows Active Directory environment or really even know yeah. the first thing about the security of it. Um yeah. But yeah, we're like we'll bring him bring him on for a couple of months, and sure, and like that was super super influential, right? Like talking mm. to experienced sysadmins, talking to people that were like pen testers that had spoken about or spoken to them for more than say thirty minutes at a conference mm. or something. Like actually being able to sit down and talk to people that were working in the industry over a period of time longer than bumping into them socially, right? Like yeah, uh, that. That was super influential. Um, I think then as I look to say what I do these days, right? It's more aligned to, to my training. It's, it's about picking up little bits of training that either I'm interested in or I think are going to be important like from a career development perspective. Mm. More realistically that I go towards what's interesting Um <laughs> Because I know that I'm going to be more yeah. invested in it and probably going to yeah. get more out of it. Mm. The other thing I'm like a huge proponent of is is reading as well. And like I've found that there are like as you get more involved into say reading or like or even like listening to podcasts, listening to to ebooks about cybersecurity, your your world and your knowledge of like what is out there in terms of other stuff for you to read obviously grows. And so, uh, being able to go from like, oh, like what's you know, a book on cybersecurity that I would say actually be interested in reading that I think is like actually cool. And I think that the more that I've read and you could come across and you're like, oh, well, that's, that was an interesting read. Um, and like, just to give an example, right, you might talk about, uh, there's a book called uh, Fierce Domain and it's really about like the history of cybersecurity for, or right. from like the late 80s through to 2012 mm. and the 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 perspectives and the history you get on kind of the industry and, and really I, I think of it more of a, as a problem than necessarily an industry but when you read a book like that and then you get a bit of an impression of like okay well that's that's like one perspective on on the history of it and that's someone's like trying to trying to wrap like 30 years into a book that's like 250 pages and you go and read another book that's like a little bit similar, but a bit different. Uh, yeah. and, and you just get so... I feel like recently stuff like that has been more influential on my education mm. um, because it just... It kind of like sparks little bits and pieces that I'm like, I want to go read more about that or I want to go learn more about that. Um like, yeah, if you were like getting into the industry and you managed to say get like an initial, you know, you get a sec plus under your belt or you, you know, you've gone and done an OSCP or something, like there's so much 
good stuff out there these days that you can go and pick mm. up. Like I think the last one that I probably paid for and did was like some of the Sector 7 like malware development, like persistence training. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I really rated that because it was like you get a VM, you sit down, it's a couple hundred bucks um, and then it's just like here are here's like a bunch of either PowerShell scripts or C C code. You compile it, you run it, you reverse it. Um, and then here's like a list of 30 different persistence mechanisms on Windows. And like mm. you might have known half of them or yeah. three quarters of them before you did it. Yeah. Now you know a bunch more, you know, how they persist, you know, where they live, you know, what tools can, can show you them. And yeah. so stuff like that, I think is... You know, for a couple hundred bucks for realistically like it's a, a solid weekend's worth maybe a couple of weekends worth of work mm. and like the knowledge that you've taken away from that is easily worth a couple hundred bucks and it's so funny the like i remember when i first went through i was actually considering the initial courses that i did but how much quality training there is out there now yeah and and i'm a huge proponent for paying for training because i think it's just the stuff that you pay for is really good um but just how quality it is compared to when I was first going through. Like this was when I first started, it was early days hack the box. Yeah. Where it was quite... Yeah, you had to get like crack the freaking code yeah, to, to crack get the, the access. Invite thing. And that was actually quite difficult if you'd never done pen testing before. Yeah. And so you would just follow this guide to like get your login thing. I remember doing that. Um, but now there's like all these training pathways. That's quite cheap. But there's so many other providers out there for a couple of hundred bucks. Because I, I also remember doing OSCP early days. And that was like yeah. two grand. I, it's still like two grand now or something Australian. But it, and it's a good course. Don't get yeah. me wrong. But if you're starting out, like that's not what I would recommend to people anymore. Because totally. there's so much, so much else out there that's cheaper and. Yeah. yeah, and also just the, the requisite levels of knowledge too, right, are so mm. different. And I didn't have a great appreciation for it until I started doing some of this training work mm. and talking to people that you kind of, you almost assume a certain level of knowledge after you've been working in the yes. industry, right? And it's yeah. it's stuff like an IP address. And like you look at an IP address and you go, oh yeah, cool, like... I understand, like, you know, shy of going and actually, like, reading the RFC on, like, the structure of an IP address. Like, I understand how to use it in a practical way every day. Yeah. But you, when, when someone that doesn't have that goes and looks at some training that has an IP address, they're like, what is this thing? Why do I keep typing it into my terminal? And why does it matter that the numbers are right every time? And why does it matter where the dot go, dots go? And, like, all or, that type of stuff. Or even if... Or even if they look at it and they don't realize that each octet has a certain range. So if they saw well, that's an a big one, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't working right. And then they're just yeah. like, why is this now not working? So just totally. like, yeah, that core fundamental knowledge of networking. Yeah, is, trying to teach yeah, people subnetting, people. like all, all of that. Yeah. I was yeah. like, yeah, it's, to yeah. It's, a, it's a challenge to like get all of that information compressed into a single course. Um, and yeah, I tend to think that it, it almost need, it does need to be two in some ways. Um, I, and I always find no matter how well you think, cause I'm in course development now, yeah. like I think you get to a certain point in your career and you start, if you've got the aptitude to teach, you naturally just fall into it in mm. whatever company you're in. And so the course development now, it never stops surprising me that no matter how well I try and create the foundation knowledge in the course, there's always a student or feedback where they'll be like, oh, I don't understand this. And I'm like, ah, oh, okay, that's assumed knowledge for me. Yep. The 10 people that I had review this course, like none of them picked it up because it's all just It's assumed knowledge brain. for them too, right? Yeah, it's assumed like knowledge You need for to them. get your mum to review it. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then it's funny because there is like, there is still a level of, and, it, and it's like an assessment each time, right? Because it still should be a level of baseline knowledge. Yeah. But then it's when it is something that's like out there and you're like, oh, okay. Like I really did take this, this nugget of knowledge for granted. Yeah. Um, absolutely. That I picked it up years ago and it's never, like I've never questioned it, but you have someone that's just like, I don't understand this at all. Yep. So, yeah, no, really uh, funny. Super, super relatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was actually funny. I was interviewing um, 
a, a guy named uh, Chuck Cobb, who he's the lead training instructor for Magnet Forensics um, mm-hmm. only a couple of days ago. And so Magnet's taken the stance of um, they have like a full training cell just for to create their certifications and mm. everything. And uh, it was really good talking to him because I think a lot of companies, especially technology companies, want to create their own training. But it's they don't want to invest too much into it. And so you have people, so like part of my role is creating training courses, but it's not my primary role. Mm. And just how long, you would know this, how long it takes to create a course and yep. to curate it and to keep it updated is a full-time job. Yep. And like, it was really interesting just having that. He was just like, yeah, like we didn't used to do this this way, but he has like, I think four or five people under him that all they do is course content. And because the product shifts so much, they're constantly adding new content. So it's 100%. not like they never have something to do. And they yep. also instruct, so they run like instructor-led yep. courses, yep. which is beneficial as well. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I've run into uh, a couple of different opinions, right, on uh, like in in-house training or like what's it like product product delivered or product driven training, where mm-hmm. you know, let's take the example of Magnet or the example that I've got in my mind is is CrowdStrike, right? And they offer yeah. training with like the CrowdStrike certified analyst yeah responder Quite and hunter or whatever of, it is or an administrator companies. responder yeah. and hunter and initially like i was super skeptical of like it as a concept um mm. and have met a lot of people that are like no nah, like vendor certs that's the word i'm looking for vendor certs mm. they're like vendor certs you know aren't worth aren't worth the paper that they're written on mm. but my perspective on that has like changed drastically probably in the last Mm. two or three years where I have seen just the incredible difference that it can make in terms of onboarding someone into an organization. If you you put them on that, that vendor training, like, Hey, we use this tool, go and get the vendor training and how to use the tool Mm. rather than trawling your way through, you know, the 14 different confluence pages that have been written um, by someone in the team on how to use feature X in product Y and actually having a you know, concerted or just a dedicated piece of time that someone can sit down and learn about that product. Um, and I think one of the things that possibly, you know, I, don't, I don't know how exactly expensive some of this training is, right? But I, I'm really of the opinion that if you're in charge of acquiring software, or in charge in charge of acquiring security software, and you're spending let's say a hundred thousand dollars a year to buy that software, spend the extra ten, spend the extra fifteen, whatever it may be, to pay for the training and set aside the training for your people in that product mm. every year, or you know maybe you have two three seats a year, whatever it is, mm. because the the difference in how operationalized that technology becomes within your environment is night and day like Mm. the the team that has people that have actually done the training know how the product works like they're the ones that are sitting there like oh well i know how to use the live response or the the remote shell capability of my edr i know what the limitations of it are i know how i can Mm. script it up i know how the inbuilt saw you know orchestration feature works Mm. i know the limitations of you know, the AV versus the, you know, what this policy toggle means versus someone that comes in and just sits down and behind a console and starts to use that product. Yeah. They're poking their way around blind, right? And they're, yeah. they don't know what they don't know. So yeah. it, it's just, and I've seen it firsthand numerous times, like it is just night and day in terms of the value that you then extract yeah. out of that product. I think there's, there's a few things I'm picked there though as well because like CrowdStrike is a good example. Like they're, they're a massive company and would invest a lot into that vendor training. And so the mm. vendor training has to be good to start with. And yeah. I think so true. if you're, if you're a vendor, vendor certification that's offering a certification, you're selling your course, then you should, you're not only teaching the tool, but you're teaching the fundamentals for what the tool is trying to do. So yeah, if you're like, true threat hunting and you're trying to find persistence well you then need to teach what is persistence it's not just like here's how you go find it and then there's no context to it because that doesn't help the analyst totally 
where I see it different, because the, the interview that I was doing with was with the other podcast that I'm on, Forensic Focus. So that's quite law enforcement heavy mm-hmm. with the vendors that we normally talk to. And that's actually a requirement because if you're sending, if you're making this tool and your analysts have no idea how to really use the tool, but also they then have to go into court and explain. Yeah. The whole how, expert witness piece to it. Yeah, the whole out expert witness piece. So that the training in general in those kind of platforms, so like Magnet Forensics, for example, um, like I'm thinking other things like Nuix, Ax- well, Axiom's now part of Magnet Forensics as well. But it really needs to be on point because if they get cross-examined and they're like, oh, but what is the tool doing with this evidence? Or like, how's your yeah. workflow working? Like, not only do they need to know the ins and outs of all their data, but the ins and outs of every tool that they of use the tool, as yeah. well. Because someone's freedom is at, sta- at stake here. So I think we're seeing a, a lag in the IT industry space with vendor training and certifications, like except for some of those probably really big ones that are investing a lot into those certs. Mm. Whereas it's always been with the law enforcement piece because it's had to be there. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, 100% agree with you. Like if that good certifications, like teaching fundamentals, teaching the ins and outs of the tool, like you don't get trained on it. You're not going to get the best out of the tool. And you'll, it's like you're totally. trying to use your screwdriver like a hammer. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Mm. Oh man, I like this chat. I love training, training chats. It's great. It's <laughs> what I'm into at the moment. It's like my I mean, life. it's, it, I mean, it, I think it comes back to your point, right? That it's like, it's got to be good. It's got to be good content. It's got to be good training too. Yeah. It's, that's just the, the underwritten caveat to all of it it's like yeah you have a shitty vendor cert you put it's also you it's also turn people be off taught, yeah but it's also going to be taught like i'm a huge proponent for my the courses that i create right like even basic things like how people learn so like we we mm. offer self-paced learning only at the moment but it's like i write it i film videos mm-hmm. like people can listen to a voice because like i know like I listen, I learn really well from reading, but I know some people learn really well when someone's narrating. Mm. So it's like, how, how are you offering the training to your people, but also accessibility. So someone who might be working and they can't read for long periods of time because their eyesight might be bad or they can't concentrate when they do it, but they can listen and they can absorb all that information, then use it in their day to day job. Like how are you catering to, to that demographic as well? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's um, I, I don't know if you've done uh, much like JavaScript development, but no, I don't. I try and stay away from Java. Yeah, JavaScript. so so valid. Uh, but it's just, whew, it's like trying to pick up like the world's most difficult puzzle every time <laughs> you pick it up. Um, but that. That whole technology stack has so much stuff built around it, like for mm. accessibility. It's it's super interesting. Like it's it's stuff that you wouldn't consider until you go to pick up something to go and start writing a bit of JavaScript mm. in like a modern web framework mm-hmm. um, that you just wouldn't consider about like okay, well, yeah, what CSS tags and classes are like compliant with the accessibility frameworks and which mm. are the ones like, yes, you're trying to hack something together and get it going. But if you actually want it accessible, like there's about, you know, there's another framework over here that is going to do the things and, and stretch and squash the way that you expect it to and work on a screen reader and mm. work in high contrast mode, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And it's, it's okay. just like... It's a one. It's it's no wonder, right? That JavaScript, or like full stack web devs, get paid what they get paid, basically, because it's just mm. so much stuff to be to be across. Um, and if you're just an average punter coming in to try and do a little bit of it, yeah, incredibly overwhelming. Yeah, and I find like for the listeners listening as well, like I find a lot of people ask sometimes, like, is is cyber difficult? And I like. I don't consider myself that intelligent. It's just yeah, knowing <laughs> a lot about a little things and talking about web stack developers, right? Like it's not that they're smarter than the average person. They just know that a lot of stuff exists, which is half of what programming is. Is like, yeah. is there a library to do what you're wanting to do better than coding it from scratch? Yeah. Because yeah. 
go use that library. But you need to know it exists. So you need to be reading all the time, constantly, to kind of really hone your skills as a programmer. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, like you said, I think it comes back to reading. It comes back to having mm. ex like constant exposure to new new information that you can derive yeah. knowledge from. Mm. Mm. All right, we've digressed with training, which I really liked. That that was a good <laughs> um, Going back to your career, what would you consider a highlight for you? Uh, um, Can be more I, than one as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of my highlights were definitely... Uh, in government, like some of the incidents that I get to respond to and some of the people that I get to work with, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Like incidents of real consequence with in amazing people that I would have never met had I not been uh, you know, in, in some of those environments. Um, in, in general, I think that's some of the, uh, some of the stuff that you can just be exposed to working within like you know the federal government uh can be so can really influence your thinking in in a way that is makes you remember that the little bits and pieces that we do every day in, in cyber and the, the ones and zeros don't really necessarily matter as much as people think they do like yeah. it's it's important right and it it has a significant impact on economies and on the, the lives of people and trust in the systems that we work with every day. Mm -hmm. But in the grand scheme of things, right, like, like you can go and look at like, oh, government's going to go and invest a billion dollars into cyber. And it's like, whoa, crazy. And you know, figure out like how many billions of dollars did the government invest into concrete in the last three weeks? <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's probably like forty. And it's like yeah. it's like yeah, it's important, but damn, like, geez, man, concrete is also very expensive and important. Yeah. Um, and also what we build found like civilization on. Yeah. Um. So I I think that there's been a number of like really um experiences in government that were quite highlights for me this is the problem with like spending a career kind of working in with incidents and then with the government is talking specific details get tricky but mm. I, I suppose i also think about say some of the the stuff that i did um you know with with crowdstrike uh, was one of the teams that i um worked with there there was some some incidents that we responded to that i thought like man that was cool like that was mm. some and, and very gratifying in one of the teams where i was managing the teams seeing the team come together and like yeah actually have an impact on uh have an impact on like multiple threat actors in an environment that was like a super juicy super juicy environment yeah. you know multiple threats yeah some bespoke some off the shelf tooling um but, you know the team coming together and using the tools that they've been trained in plus ones that we'd kind of built um or worked on internally to to have an impact and really and help the customer out and that's the other thing right like i know that you've experienced this too but that that feeling of like customer gratitude when you know you've done a good job and, and the customer recognizes that as well and you've really helped them out of a sticky spot like that's yeah. truly that's like the end of the day that you go oh man like that's that's kind of what makes it worth it particularly the uh like it's the people in the call face like yeah. when you respond totally. to a customer it's the it admins it's yep. the support staff it's the like you always get the gratitude i think through the official channels of like the CISO reaching out or the CEO being like, yeah. oh, thanks. Like you guys did a really good job. But it's always good when you see like my most fond incidents were where you come out of the end of it. And even if it's not a good, a great result, but where the IT admins are just like, man, we're, we were so happy you guys were here, like yeah. helping us and, and being along that journey. Because like everything's people. So... Yeah. they're stressed out of their mind especially if it's the first incident they've ever been in and you kind of roll in with all this experience and you're like it's okay it's not even if it is you roll in every time you're like it's not the worst we've seen it's fine we'll, it, we'll get on top of it like, exactly exactly yeah. right so, um, yeah I get that yeah I mean like I, a funny one like 
you get out at the back end of the incident and it's like the last call or the second last call and one mm. of the admins being like hey like i found your facebook profile like oh, i'm gonna send you a friend request on facebook yeah. and it's <laughs> just like it's oh, like oh yeah. I've had, I've had, yeah, so no, like I don't know where we're going with this, but because <laughs> my um, so my LinkedIn's fairly open, but I like I got quite a lot of those where people would connect after an incident as well, yeah, because I would, and that was like I was always fine with that because it was more they were just tracking, I think they're like, oh, it'd be cool to see like where you go next kind of thing, and yeah, yeah, it's always, and you, I guess, those people, it's interesting, I've actually now once they've had an incident and they go through that there are some people that get really interested more in cybersecurity. Yeah. And then you'll see them at conferences and they'll be like, oh, how's it going? Like, and you, you get to like catch up and have this chat, particularly when I worked in the ICS space. Yeah. Like, cause they're... Well, of course, yeah. Yeah, they're, like the, oper- the operators don't care what's threatening their system. They're just really on top of safety. So as soon as yeah. they, if they have an incident and you help them through it, then they're like, they're on board. It's, it's as if they're like, anything that's threatening their system they're just interested in it yeah and so then you would see them at conferences and stuff and they're like all right and how do we stop that from happening again which is that safety attitude is such and and we both experience that in the military right yeah yeah like safety always kind of attitude um yeah it's so so nice to see carry into cybersecurity sometimes which is really cool man I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if that's like i don't know i don't know what the statistic would be but like let's say 10 15 percent of like people getting interested in cyber like i was literally talking to a guy um at sec talks brisbane on mm. thursday night uh, about the fact that you know, he was just sitting there by himself went up and had a chat and he used to be a web developer he's getting into cyber because one of his servers had a crypto miner running on it and oh, it's right and like yeah. literally that was his intro to the industry and i'm like i'm sure yeah. if you spoke to anyone that's come from like an it or developer background maybe the thing that got them interested in it was that initial exposure to to a breach or to yeah. a you know, he was like I, oh you know we deleted the you know, deleted the crypto miner and it kept coming back and we had to figure out why it kept coming back and i was like my friend yeah. there's a word for it um, <laughs> <laughs> look, wait until you learn about the the world of frameworks um and <laughs> yeah that's but, super interesting it's and it's funny like i really like hearing people who've come from a non-technical background like what sparked their interest Mm. and it's some like sometimes news reports i i find i would have expected that to be a lot higher than yeah what i when i talk to people but sometimes it's like um so for for women especially when i talk to them it's usually like the threat of cyber stalking or totally someone tracking them like um, in yeah. that kind of space or just privacy in general where they're concerned about like banks tracking because like banks now track all of our spending habits and that kind of thing so yeah. they get interested they get more and more interested in privacy and then how to protect it which then just bleeds into cybersecurity, but from a personal level but then that opens up a whole world of oh, okay well i want to make a career out of this now like how do i yeah how can i be involved in this and protect myself more and just un- and it's hard when you're not in the industry to like invest so much time in your own personal thing. So it's almost it's like a hard when you're in the industry too. Well, like, mate, I yeah, mean, like you look I've at the still environment. Got Michael Michael Bezel's book about open source intelligence that I haven't read because so yeah. yeah, it's hard. Well, it, it even yeah, if if you're just not even the average punter, right? But like yeah. even the way that the the environment that we interact with is is architected <laughs> to use the term architect is <laughs> i think perhaps generous. a bit glamorous very generous. yeah very yeah. generous right yeah. um maybe if we said uh, tied together with like <laughs> yeah. twine and duct tape perhaps yep. um but with the way that it is like there's just no control um and you are truly at the mercy of the people that you and i go to respond at incidents too right <laughs> so well, even even um like you look at not necessarily the australian system as much but if you look at the u.s system right like they they've tied everything to social security numbers mm. um which they was not what it was designed for yeah. and now people are potentially exposed of identity threat theft if that gets exposed and it's 
companies get breached, their social security number goes out with all their details, like that in itself is a huge personal risk, but you can't, like you can't get a home loan in the States without a social security number. Right, so exactly. Kind of personal security is, you can only get so far because governments make you rely on these things, which is difficult. Um, yeah, that's like a challenge in itself that, when you said architected, that's why it's generous. Because totally. You've got thing, oh, things like couldn't, this couldn't right. agree more. Yeah. Poor choice of word. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. So we'll move on to the next question. What passion projects do you have at the moment? And this can be cyber or otherwise. So feel yeah. free. Oh, geez, mate. Plenty, plenty of stuff kind of in my, floating around in my mind, right? Like, we were just talking about my house before and so mm, one of the things true. is certainly you know I've, I've become a bit of a uh a diy landscaper recently mm. not no good just trying to really it's about mitigating water uh, yeah like okay. when we get a when we get a really big downpour um you know we get quite a bit of water that kind of goes under our house which is okay because our house mm. is raised but um I think the, the plan down the road is to probably to build in and enclose it. So before yeah. we do that, we really want to be really want to be controlling the water, be the beavers of our um, you know, of our little block of land. Yeah. Uh, so doing that, and then I've got a little bit of rot in some of the timber on the house. So I had some mm. plans done up uh, by an engineer that actually knows what he's talking about. Um, that I will. I'll have a crack at doing like carpentry myself. And so it's relatively structural on the house though. So I'm hoping that, you know, there's not, you don't just see a news article about a a house collapsing um, somewhere in Australia. It's not mine. So fingers (laughs) crossed. Yeah. And apart from that, I think the things like kind of cyber wise and and projecty, I spend a lot of time at the moment thinking about pivoting between information like probably a a really a disproportionate amount of time um where i think that so many of the tools and things that we use are designed to get you a very like get you an answer to some type of information that's like a question about what file did this process write or Mm. what's kind of going on at this moment in time or, or what's happened over this period, but give me an answer to that question and then you get that answer back and then you go, great. You, you look through it, you analyze that information and then you decide where am I going next? Um, mm. Really, that's that's kind of that analytical process, right? Like if you wanted to distill down that first question of what do I do during a day, it's probably that. It's I ask mm. a question, I get answer back and then I decide what question I'm going to ask next mm-hmm. from the data that I've, I've got it available to me Mm -hmm. the thing that i think as an industry is done very poorly is actually that process of going from now i've analyzed something how where do i go next and if that information is held in disparate systems if that information is um even in the same system like you're essentially reliant on some type of pivot existing in a product in like a web UI that you click on or some custom logic that you've written via like a response from a from an API request. Yeah. So what does good pivoting look like, right? And and that's really what I'm spending a lot of time thinking about at the moment um, yes. and want to, uh, you know, is really really something that like I want to try and try and solve because I think it's something that uh, cybersecurity like if we just draw a big circle around cybersecurity analysts, right? Like blue teamers, it's something they spend so much of their time doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it is really, it's something that's like so trash. Like the way that we do it at the moment is just so trash, I think. Like you can have a pivot in Splunk, you can have like a click to view, view this thing, but you hit limits very, very quickly about like, okay, well now you're in the analysis view and the analysis view doesn't have ways to go further from there. Yeah. So what does kind of that, like that, not to use, not to overhype, but that kind of like infinite, infinite pivoting, what does that start to look like? 
Um, so I, I wonder if this is, I, I had a really good chat. Oh, did I interview him yet or not? I'd have to go back. But um, when I used to work at CCX, there was a um, investigator there that I used to work with and he used to be in the police um, as well. So it was quite good that we had these kind of conversations. His name was um, Gary Hunter. I think I've had him on the podcast or maybe I was meant to have him on and he's still coming up. Um, but it's teaching analysts, like as you said, with pivoting, the investigative mindset. So, mm. which I, I loved because when I was a kid, like I wanted to be a detective and it feels like that. Yeah. But it's that when you're talking about that infinite pivoting of you have the information come back and you analyze it. And then sometimes the tools are trash. Like they're just... They don't give you the information you need or you can't pivot from there. But as an investigator, what's your investigative mindset to go, okay, I know that there'll be information over here or you mm. hypothesize your next move and then you go, here's my hypothesis. How do I get this information? Yeah. Now, you may not have a tool. You may have to go manually pull the logs or... Yeah. But it speaks to both your technical aptitude and knowledge, but also your understanding of human behavior of well, this is an attacker on the other end. Yeah. Or if it's automated, someone has written it. So it's yep. not just like something we can't comprehend. But if you were that person, kind of... Because th there's been times in incidents where I've gone, okay, if I was an attacker and I was lazy, what would I do? Mm. And you're like, mm. you hypothesize and you come up and you go look in that folder or you, you run a hunt across the network because you're like... And when it turns back positive and you're like, oh, I found it. Yeah. Very gratifying. You're like, yeah, it's super gratifying. And you're just like, oh, that thing. But that's the investigative mindset, which is, as yeah. an industry, I think I agree. It's not just the tools, but we also don't teach it very well. We just rely on cumulative experience and the people that pick it up, pick it up. Yeah. But we don't actively teach it. And I think we should actively teach an investigative mindset. Yeah. And, and so I think that's, uh, that's probably the other part, right? You, you, you basically said the other part to what I was thinking with this kind of concept around how do we make pivoting better, right? And it's mm. it's also how do we make pivoting easier too? Yeah. Because the barrier to entry is then on, okay, well, like you said, I've got that idea. How do I get the data? That's the next piece of mm. information. So does that look like a crowdsourced platform for like, mm. like because the amount of times, right, that say someone in company A goes and writes a, a, a let's say like a, a Splunk query across Sysmon logs to look for, you know, process, like an arbitrary process writing yeah. an arbitrary file. Insert, yeah. like to solve the problem of insert variable names for process name and file written, yeah. super trivial. But that, that like underlaying, whoa, um, that underlaying, uh, let's say like logic of like, Splunk API call, Sysmon logs, and query that's templated, and able to share that mm. with other people to be like, hey, yeah. you want that? Like, yeah, sure, you can make that query. Like, there's nothing proprietary about that. There's no reason mm. why we can't share that. Mm. And then you take it. Okay, we're not talking Splunk anymore. We're talking like another query. Maybe we're talking like Elastic, or maybe we're talking, mm. you know, SQL or whatever it may be. Mm bringing that in as like a a repository of like here's a the, the query that i think you should make based off this is really time bound mm. the query you, you could make off this is you know now you can go make one that's like maybe super broad in time but mm. trying to help people make those jumps right with a that's that's kind of what i'm spending a lot of time thinking about is like what does a, sol a solution or part of the solution to that problem look like yeah and it's a tough question to answer because not only is it like, like you said, that's not proprietary and the Splunk versus Sysmon, like Splunk is very common and like Sysmon is as well, but then there's so many tools that do that same thing. So then mm -hmm. you can have the concept and then your limiting factor, like someone might find that. So say you created a GitHub repository that had a whole bunch of these things, but then the technical limitation becomes for the analyst side is well how do i convert the splunk query into my platform query if they're junior because mm. they may not have the the yeah. understanding but but also the fact that even though the tools do very similar things is 
does the tool have all the stuff that the Splunk is pulling in terms of like what's coming into the activity document, what data is there, what yep. format is it in, what, like then you get really down to the nitty gritty, like what is maybe you're searching over a field that's tokenized in Splunk, but mm -hmm. your tool doesn't tokenize that. So then how do you improve the accuracy of your search in that tool? And that's yep. like, then it comes back to that training, the technic hard skill technical training, I guess. And, and I guess in a circle back to our conversation about vendor training. Totally, when, yeah. When vendor training is really good and you understand how to convert other tools into that tool, then you can really get into fully utilizing your security stack within your organization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a, I don't know, I don't know, man. It's all, it's all a bit of a mess and it's all a bit of a jungle. Oh, um, I don't, I definitely don't envy, um, I don't envy people that are trying to make a break into the industry at the moment like mm. i think there is i suppose i envy the amount of like content that's out there but it's all it's a bit of a double-edged sword right there's so much yes. out there and how do you know what snake oil um that's i think the definitely that's the yeah. the, the tricky thing because it's not just snake oil from like a some of the training a lot of it's like quite good but then it's like all right what products uh what do you want to steer clear of from a product perspective and yeah, uh, no, it's all but, but also like you, it could be it could be a really good product, right? But then you go for jobs that don't use those products. So then, yeah, like how focused is their training on the product rather than the fundamentals? So yeah, exactly. Are you actually learning something that's valuable for an, a job that, like you, while it's good to learn the tools you use within your company, you're likely to move companies. So at some point, you do need to be just tool agnostic. Um, because you would have seen it in, well, maybe not Crash Rock as much, but like when I worked external IR, like we would mostly roll in and use whatever tools were in place. Oh, totally, yeah. So then you're just like relying on the people there to do the querying and you're just like, okay, this is what we're looking for. So that's yeah. like difficult in itself. I mean, I'm, I'm going through it at the moment, going from mm. essentially using Splunk or Splunk equivalents for the last, I don't know, six, seven years. Mm. Um, and now going into an environment that is, is basically a SQL equivalent mm. to querying yeah. my data. Yeah. So having to re yeah, a lot of joins or trying to avoid joins. <laughs> how, can I, how can I write this query without using a join? Without a join, yeah. <laughs> What's not going to crash my system? Um, Sorry, I missed right. you there. I, the birds have started going crazy. Oh no, no! I just, I just said it's always a question of how not to crash your system. Mm, um, yeah, yeah, with, exactly. With your queries, yeah, exactly. I come up with that all, all the time. So we're approaching the end, but um, I've got two more questions for you yep. before you finish. So, what do you do to get away from work and unwind? Yeah, so uh, a couple, a couple of things. One of the big ones for me is definitely getting in around like doing stuff in the house, um, mm. getting outside and, and working on stuff there. Cause it feels, uh, it feels like I'm learning something while I'm doing mm. it. Uh, and it feels, it's very gratifying. Like once you've gone and done something, build something with your hands, so you're like, ah, oh, this is, and this is directly improved the environment that I live in. Mm. Uh, so really, I really enjoy that. Um, it's not something that, like, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I thought that I would have said I enjoyed. Yeah. But I, I suppose I was very fortunate, like, growing up. Like, my like my dad's a tradie. And mm. and I suppose, really, like, my grandfathers were both, you know, they both kind of worked tradie adjacent jobs as well. Mm. And um, in an, grew up kind of in an environment that was like, uh, you're going to learn to plumb this you're gonna to learn to yeah. maintain this you know, know how to you're gonna learn how to do all of these things um mm. very practical and so they're all skills that i'm very glad that i was given the opportunity to kind of learn and then you know you stack youtube on top of that and like you look at my <laughs> youtube watch history in the last like 12 months and i'm sure if you open my we open my youtube feed right now it's like 70% of it would be 
uh, the best way to build a deck and <laughs> flashing advice for, you know, removing siding off a house and reflashing and yeah. um, stuff like yeah. that. So I uh, spend like a good chunk of time time doing that. Apart from that, like I really like to cook. So I'm a big, okay. big cook. Um, I've got, well, hope, hopefully the chicken is no longer in the oven and my fiance's pulled it out of, uh, pulled it out of the oven, but I had it yeah. had a thermometer in it, so it should it should have beeped when it got to temp. Okay. So we should be okay. Yeah. Uh, and and then in addition to that, I do a bit of bit of running, bit of cycling, uh, and some Olympic weightlifting. So nice. There's the yeah the good old uh, gym that I go to. Help them out yeah. there as the as a treasurer of the club. So. Make sure the books are all looking good and coaches nice. are getting paid. And, yeah. you know, it feels good, right? It's a little bit of community service, just a not-for-profit. Um, yeah. And, you know, get that, get that going. And apart from that, nice. bit of reading, bit of, bit of watching TV, mate. Nothing too crazy. Yeah. I, lo- I also like to get out to, like, out to conferences and out to meetups. I probably haven't been as mm. good uh, as I'd like to be in the last maybe 10 months or so. But like I got into got into sec talks yeah. last last week on Thursday, and they had a, a lightning round, which was really cool. Like it was just mm. a five ten minute presentations. So okay. I threw my hand up and went and did a presentation about a particular file type that I'd come across and um, had worked on a little bit, like when I was at Splunk, and helped develop one of the boss of the sock scenarios for for twenty twenty four. And um, had used had, had backdoored this particular file type, um, and so I gave a little bit of a talk about about the file and just introduced people to it. So, nice. um, yeah, I'm trying to just you know, I suppose yeah. build build a bit of a, a network up here in in Brisbane where yeah. you know you don't necessarily have it. You, you leave that Canberra bubble, and you yeah. you, know, you kind of know everyone, and then you go to yeah, go to a, I was gonna say big city, but I'll put it in air quotes. Big city like Brisbane, it's bigger than Canberra, yeah. bigger than Canberra, exactly. Yeah, it's also just like I've been the same. Like I've been really slack since I've been up here with rejoining that cyber community, mm. and like, it, like it happens whenever you move, right? And yeah, you'd know from like when you're in the military and you're moving around quite a lot. Sometimes it's you only know like you know that you may only be a posting in the one spot for maybe three years so it's hard to invest that time when you when you know you're going to move but it's um yeah i definitely need to uh to probably invest more time into the community because like i love meeting new people especially when you get people that come and they want to join the industry and yeah like, but i mean i'd say the thing that ask and talk to yeah the thing that you do really well right though is like you maintain a pretty vibrant like online community too oh yeah 100%. like yeah. I think that you definitely shouldn't underplay the you know, the value of that. Like mm. I look at myself, right? I'm really not someone that, you know, stays very active online or mm. even very good at replying to people's messages when they send me a message. <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a bit slack at that. But really where I like to spend time is like face to face with people, like having a yeah. chat over a beer or something. And mm. that's like I couldn't do what you do with like hardly adequate and the podcast and, mm. and keeping that kind of community going. Like for me online, I just kind of, it, w- it would fizzle out and die. So mm. don't underplay that kind of, yeah. You know. No, I, I definitely get it. I had, um, I'll actually have him on the podcast. I think he'll be September's episode, but US based mm. reached out to me ages ago to like join the discord server that, that I have. And um, for those that are interested, I'll chuck the link in the show notes. Um, Good plug. But he reached plug. out, had a chat about what he, what we thought he should be studying to get into the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but reached out the other day and said that he managed to pick up an internship um, and is currently in, in the internship. And uh, I'll be interviewing him in August as that ends, because um, it's always great to see like people who are brand new to the industry, like what it's currently like. Because obviously, I have my perspective on when I entered. Yeah. And I have my perspective now about interviewing people but it's completely totally. different from the perspective of someone coming in so um 
for the listeners, if you're interested in that, that'll be the September episode. Chris Else, I think his uh, his last name, but he'll be on the on the podcast then. Yeah, and I'd say that's like to to read the tea leaves, right? Of his experience, I would say that you can abstract that general advice out to anyone looking to get into cybersecurity anywhere, which is yeah. if you're going and doing an entry level course and trying to break into the industry, don't stop at doing that entry level course. Like the thing, I hope that it's been a little bit of a theme for anyone listening, like off this conversation has been like, like reading and staying up to date is so, yep. so important in this industry in the, well, any industry that you want to succeed in, but going in and joining little you know, social groups, online groups, subreddits, you know, news feeds, whatever it is, like exposure to different sources of information and dare I say even opinion, yeah. like to to some of those pieces of information, like Twitter, Mastodon, whatever it is, mm-hmm. is all so important to, I suppose, like demonstrating a commitment to and, and if you're talking to an interviewer like they're probably up to date on what's going on in the industry mm. if you can show that you're not just doing a training course but you're also up to date on the industry like that's bonus points in my mind yeah and i think it's like i'd be interested to hear your thought on this but it's something that i've had for a few of the guests that i've had on also is that it's not not to go out and do a course and really, especially if you're working in another industry, all right? So you've mm. got other commitments, other, Limited work time. Ones, other work one, limited time. You're, you're just doing this in your after work hours and weekends is don't burn yourself out. Like don't jump in and do like yeah. five courses back to back, but set yourself a schedule and treat it like you're watching TV. So yeah. maybe normally you'd watch TV every night, but two nights a week, you say to yourself, I'm going to do three hours of study where maybe one hour is reading the news, two hours is doing a programming course or some other course that you've picked up. Because when you're going into interviews, it's that motivation over time and dedication over time. And it's an industry that's always changing. So, but if you burn yourself out, you'll hate it or like you won't last. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, it was funny. I, for some reason, it really stuck in my brain. But mm. I remember having a chat to Tom James, um, mm. like, I don't know, 2017, 2018, the, something. PCO? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and we were just having a chat about you know, people working in the industry. And he had, I suppose, for context, right, like this, this guy, Tom, was basically the, the HR guy um, at the team. And his perspective on it was like we've got all these people that are super passionate about mm. wanting to do cybersecurity, and they go and do cybersecurity in their day and or you know maybe they're not quite doing exactly what they want to be doing in cybersecurity during the day and at night they're working to getting towards the things that they want to be doing in cybersecurity. Mm. and it's like so many of them end up just in this position where they're kind of like jaded and burnt out with what they're doing because they're not actually maybe maybe the realistic approach to what they're trying to achieve isn't doing it the way that they're doing it maybe they need to approach it another way but just have that that awareness that like it, you know marathon not a sprint yeah. and look after yourself right yeah yeah definitely and it's um yeah like when you're picking your projects you can pick the interests to really get you in, invested in it but also yeah if you're not happy with where you are, it's an industry where there's quite a lot of fluidity to move. So that's yeah. another thing as well as like, there'll always be things about your job you don't like totally. that, you, that you have to do, but it's that um, I was actually talking to someone recently who was asking about, they're considering jumping out of government um, into mm-hmm. industry. And uh, they, they had a quote, they were just like, oh, it'd be interesting to see if the grass is greener on the other side. And I was like, it's not like, <laughs> No, nowhere where you think you're going to jump. Like, unless you work a really shit job. Yeah. The grass is never greener. It's just a different shade. Different, yeah. Different yeah. blend of grass. Yeah. Sometimes, I, I'll tell you what, grass in government probably gets watered more 
than the grass in <laughs> private, that's for sure. Well, that, that's what I said is you've got government, especially once you get quite high enough up, it's very stable. Like it's yeah. very, very stable. The work's always flowing. There's always projects to do. There's like we've seen in the tech industry, even at cybersecurity companies, there's mm-hmm. layoffs and there's like a chance that people will be part of that. And yep. like for those that are in government considering getting out, um, that is often my, my main thing that I say is that, and that's to say like, don't burn your bridges anywhere because maybe yeah. you want to go back to government one day and, and the government is a, uh, is a beast that will always take people in because there's always jobs to be filled. So um, yeah, just never burn your bridges for anything you do either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome, mate. Well, I think we kind of answered the last question, which was that uh, I was going to ask what recommendations you have for currently people who are looking to get in and, and wanting to. Oh, wow. You shared quite a lot of wisdom there. Uh, <laughs> is there anything else you would kind of pop in right at the end of this? Uh, geez, I think really like I just, I cannot undersell the value in like expand expand the sources of information that you you get content and information from like cast that net as wide as you can mm-hmm. and like environment is so key like yeah. i think about the best people that i work with the best people that i have worked with as well over over time mm-hmm. and so much of so much of their success has come from the environment that they've been a part of, right? They've been a part of environments where people want to learn, where people are challenging, you know, what, what is done. Um, and, you know, they're, they're willing to put the time in, like work together and create this, create this place where it's like, new new things and new discoveries are being made right because they're they're trying to ask like how can we do stuff better all the time um if you can find an environment like that that's a shortcut to success in my mind um the the other thing that i would say uh which is i was chatting to a couple of blokes at uh rucon last year Mm -hmm that were still current current raffies and one of the things that i said to them uh was like don't don't underplay the thinking that you do like this is kind of anyone in government right it's like don't underplay the thinking that you do and the the problem solving that you do on a day-to-day basis um when you're trying to think about like these is big, big-ish problems in cybersecurity, right? Like, there's always going to be the eternal, like, oh, how do we share threat intelligence better? Like, how do we stop this activity better? Like, how do we find these types of threat actors? Like, those questions are never going away. Mm. And the, I wouldn't be surprised, it's like, it's in the military that those types of questions get some of the most opportunity to be mulled over and be considered. Mm. And... I've I've seen on, I've also seen the mentality when people are asking those questions and, and trying to think about them, about there's this tendency to say, oh, well, I bet you the private sector's got it figured out, or I bet you the pri- like, oh, in private that would be so much better, yeah. um, and I don't think it's true. I think that yeah. private has its own set of you know challenges that they're working through and, and fundamentally trying to make a buck, right, yeah. and the time and space that you have when you're in government and the, some of the challenges that you're asked to, uh, to come up with solutions to will result in, you know, thinking about these ideas that hasn't necessarily been considered anywhere else. So don't underplay the value or the the legitimacy of the ideas that you have. Especially like to add to that, the constraints that you have to operate under mm. within government is quite unique. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think industry is getting better, but understanding of the value of data and classifying it in government is really well understood yeah. because there's frameworks, there's security frameworks around 
like what's secret, what's top secret, like how to handle that information, how systems are actually architectured to, mm -hmm. to deal with that. Yep. Whereas industry is very, that mentality of innovate or die and that data idea concept of classifying data is coming into some industries and some verticals, but it's lacking mm. uh, compared to where government, it's just ubiquitous. Like you, you look at any government yeah. in the world and they all treat data as classified. So yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good example, right? Of putting it into yeah. like taking, taking that and putting it into practice. So yeah. completely agree. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's just, uh, yeah, there's such, there can be such a tendency to be like, oh, like if only... If only yeah. we were this business in in this, we, yeah, you know, we had this tool to do this. Yeah. Like, yeah, maybe in some respects, but in other respects, like you've got, um, you've got the time and space maybe to come up with your own solution yeah. or your own tool yeah. or, um, yeah, and the yeah, it's that whole the grass isn't greener. It's just a different different problem that you've got to deal. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well. Mate, thanks so much for jumping on on a Sunday and giving up some of your time to chat with me. It's been a pleasure and I've learned new things about you, which I always love interviewing my old friends, which is great. So thanks thanks quite a lot, mate. No, thank you, mate. It's love jump. Like I said, right, happy to jump on and have a chat. And yeah. uh, we've got a, you know, got a roast chook and some roast potatoes waiting yeah, out yeah, there to go and finish off. Oh, so so good. Uh, should awesome, be, be good to go. But yeah, lovely chatting you, mate. Um, and yeah, definitely we'll catch up uh, yeah. sometime up here in Brisbane. Definitely. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Nearly all of the content that I make is free. And if you want to see more, you can check me out on YouTube where I've got plenty of other videos or you can visit my website, hardlyadequate.com where there's a link to the Discord server, which I'll also chuck in the show notes. Um, or if you want to support the show, there's a way that you can donate through there as well. But thanks all for listening and I'll catch you next time.